compared to the sum total of all the things that we want to see happen in risk ice is just the tip of the iceberg. We're kind of tickling the, the features that are achievable in a relatively small amount of effort. Um, and that's what we're trying to address with the bounty scheme. So if it's like a new feature in paint or it's a new driver module, new file system, that kind of thing. It's, some of them are quite big, but they're not the huge 80% of stuff that needs to happen to risk us. So the bounty scheme has a purpose and the purpose is to address the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> the, this bit is not yet, to my knowledge, being systematically addressed in RISC-OS, but we have some thoughts about that. And at this show, I'm just going to leave it at that and not say much more. Um, <laughs> teaser. So, the other thing I want to point out is, for an individual bounty, a similar model does apply. The what you see and what you imagine uh, is the work that goes into doing one of these bounties. Typically, people will come into it thinking of just um, adding alpha transparency to sprites in paint or something like that. And in their heads, they're imagining it's a couple of weeks' work. But the truth is, software is hard. And typically, there's a whole lot more that has to go on. There's a whole lot of, right, let's do an alpha. Let's get the community involved in providing feedback. Let's deal with all the bugs that come up. Let's do a beta. Let's write some documentation. Let's update the user guide. Um, there's a lot more work that happens behind the scenes um, and we're happy to help with that but the majority of it is on the generous people that claim the bounty and do the work and this slide is if anyone does happen to see this um, just be aware when you're getting involved in a bounty um, it helps to remember that there's a lot more than just writing that feature involved in doing the work so the git client bounty where we've got to is roughly halfway against our original plan of all the things that we want to see doing. Um, but it's actually, it's pretty much fully functional for all the basic stuff that you need to do as a developer right now. Um, so we're, we have versions of it that people can download and play with right now. And what we're actually thinking of doing, and if anyone involved in the bounty is here, this might come as a surprise, but we've decided we're just actually going to pay that person half of the bounty now because we think they've done such a great job um, and they've been working on this for a long time. We don't want to wait right till the end to just say, you can have it all. Um, so actually, we're really pleased with how this is going. And they've done certain things that are just a complete stretch goal that we never thought were part of the plan, but they've just done it and it's great. So, <coughs> for example, Git is a system that allows you to store all of the source code for something, and then you can say, I'm going to change this and store that, and I'm going to change this over here and store that. And then you can keep rolling back time, and you can look at what was the one from two days ago, what was the version 7 of this. Um, what they've done is like a file display, so you can, you can mount any Git repository, and you can see all of the revisions that exist in that repository as folders. And when you go into a folder for version 1.68, you can see all of the repository contents for that version and just navigate through them. Um, so it gives you a really good view. I mean, anyone familiar with Tortoise S SVN or things like that will be familiar with that kind of thing. But <coughs> this wasn't something we asked to do as part of the bounty. It's just a really, um, really great work by the developer who's claimed it. So, um, anyone who's involved in developing for risk OS, this is a big step and it's really important, especially now all our source code is in Git. Um, so I will show you guys how to find uh, the stuff that's going on behind bounties because I think actually on our website it's a bit hidden and it shouldn't be. So I'll show you that in a bit. Um, so that's what it looks like. I'm going to move on. Um, Another thing, and we've got this as a demo on our stand, risk OS bits um, put interesting risk OS um, systems together, and they wanted to support these NVMe. These are solid state disk drives, and they're kind of the, the standard way of doing disk drives nowadays. 
um, and they're a lot faster than SD cards. And they quite altruistically thought that we want this NVM stuff writing, um, but we would like it to be open source as part of the whole community so that everyone can benefit. So Rule got involved and we've um, helped to see that can happen. And so a lot of work has been happening on this and now you'll see on our stand we've got a, a, a demo of this working. Uh, I think Riscos Bits have a, a version of it working as well. <coughs> Fantastic. I see someone waving it, the box up. Um, so the intention is that this is currently running on a Pi compute module. You can't see it behind here, but you can see it on our stand. So these little compute modules are like the core of a Raspberry Pi, but they don't have any of the connectors. And then this sits on a separate I.O. board, input-output board, which is just, this is just an example of one. Um, <coughs> and that's the thing that gives you the connectors to plug stuff into. Um, we support the Pi compute module at the moment in this current iteration of the code. In future, we're going to target other platforms like Titanium, I think is next on our hit list. So this is another bounty that's been making good progress and it's showing actual results that people can hold in their hands. Um, speed ups over an SD card, something like 10 times faster than an SD card um, and easy to buy, so easy to get hold of. There's some of the backstory as well. Um, there are a few other big pieces of the puzzle that we're working on. So it has a filer just like any other filing system and <coughs> we've made sure that HForm is able to format NVMe drives as well. And that's pretty much that. I'll move on to um, Wi-Fi, which is something that is another part of uh, the bounty scheme. Um, we have a set of bounties, and we've had a set of bounties for quite a long time to do with uh, TCPI improvements, or well, networking improvements in RISC OS. Um, we, because it was such a big job, we split it into four pieces. Um, the first one's done, the second one is in progress, and this one is a part of the third bounty, which if you look at our website today, you'll find it's been claimed as well. Um, and what's coming out of this is the ability to connect to Wi-Fi networks on most of the Raspberry Pi related platforms. So apart from like, the oldest ones, um, you've got the Pi 0 W, you've got Pi 3, Pi 4, Pi Compute Module, all of those are supported. Um, LSR originally created a Wi-Fi hat, which was a plug-in uh, adapter which had a <coughs> Wi-Fi um, interface on it and they wrote uh, some management software here to connect to networks. Um, what we've agreed with them is we're going to bring that into RISC OS as just the standard way of managing Wi-Fi. And so that, that will still remain there to work with their hardware. Um, but what we will have is we will have some software in RISC OS that allows you to use the Wi-Fi hardware that's natively in most Raspberry Pis. Um, now the status of this work at the moment is we are almost feature complete. So as you'll see from our stand, we can connect to a Wi-Fi network, we can uh, uh, type the password in, start transferring data, we can browse the internet, all of that good stuff. So that, you would imagine, is nearly everything. The bit that's missing is we're using our own Wi-Fi router at the moment where we switched all the security off. <laughs> because as of yesterday, we had some mysterious problem with the encryption stuff not working. So we just need to figure out all of the security side of it. We just need to poke the right orifice of the, uh, the hardware and make the encryption start working. And then it will be feature complete enough to start a, a beta, an open beta of this. And we feel like that's in the next month. So within the next month, you'll be able to download this stuff and try it out on your Raspberry Pi, start connecting to Wi-Fi networks and tell us what happens. Give some feedback. Um, this is huge. I think this is really uh, important. It's something, as soon as Risk OS was ported to a Raspberry Pi, the most obvious thing you kind of thought to yourself was, 
or can I just connect to my Wi-Fi network now instead of having to plug an Ethernet cable in somewhere? Um, so again, really pleased with this. Another bounty starting to yield uh, results that people can benefit from. Next up, uh, I just want to talk a little bit um, about the development environment. So we've been uh, selling this for many years now, and we've given it a bit more work recently. So at the show now, we've just released the latest version, 31D, and basically there's a few other useful warnings in the compiler now, which catch some common issues that people can do in their code, mistakes that programmers can make in their code. Um, we've also carried along a load of fixes that have happened into the main tools, which are general bug fixes in the compiler. Lots of things that have been identified in our bug tracker have been addressed. Um, we've also, these, I think it was last year, we released new toolbox gadgets for tree view and tabs. Um, we've added some new veneers into the libraries to allow you to access those through C. Um, so anyone who uh, has the 12 month window open at the moment, they last refreshed their DDE license in the last 12 months, should already have seen an email saying you've got a new version, it's free for you. And otherwise, you can get an upgrade if you already have the DDE, you can get an upgrade for us uh, from the stand. So just to kind of <coughs> spitball the future for this stuff, um, we do think there are a few other things that we would like to do with the tools over time. Uh, one of them is about adding the latest C standard. So there's quite a lot of interesting and useful features in the C language um, which have been introduced recently. Um, we also want to improve the FP performance, that's floating point maths. There's several applications that make heavy use of that and you could make a massive speed up of C programs if the compiler supported the hardware um, for doing that. Um, and there's a few other bits and pieces. Uh, just a little thing like uh, supporting 64-bit architectures that we would like to add as well. Um, I'll say a couple of words on that. If anyone was looking closely at the Christmas um, advent calendar for RiscOS, there was an online advent calendar, was it the icon bar? Um, and Rule submitted some photos for our contribution. This was one of them. And for anyone who understands what this is telling them, you'll see there's a C program here, there's um, a disassembly of it here, where it's pointing out that it's um, ARCH64 over here. So what we've done is we have got the compiler so that it is able to understand enough, <laughs> enough of the C language to turn that into ARCH64, which is probably about 1%. <laughs> um, but it's a step. So we've got, the, we've got the beginning, we've got the seed of what's needed to extend the compiler to support the 64-bit ARM instruction set, which is our stepping stone to all of the stuff that's written in C in RISC OS. What you ideally want to do is just recompile that 64-bit. And then the only remaining problem to getting RISC OS running on 64-bit computers is all of the ARM code bits of RISC-OS, which is just, you know, probably a, a couple of man decades worth of work. Um, but, so just that. Um, but at least this is a step, um, and it's definitely something we're, we're going to keep plugging away at in the background. <coughs> so, uh, another topic which people are probably wondering about, RISC-OS 5.3.0 is the next stable release, which, um, I will freely admit to having been talking about this in several different shows over the last year or two. Um, so the, the biggest question, I guess, is how close is it and when, when is it coming out? And the answer to that is it's not really in our hands um, and it hasn't been for some time. So we have this traffic light system where we talk about the health and the status of the various different platforms. Uh, what I can say is that all of the non-platform specific issues that were blocking a stable release have been fixed. So those have all been resolved. Um, we have completed all of the work on updating the user guide and there's been loads of other things have happened since 5.2.8 that are part of RISCOS 5.30. 
However, if you look at the traffic light system, um, you can see that there are various platforms that aren't green yet. Some of them have even just one minor, well not minor, but middling issue that needs to be resolved. And these are not risk or open development tasks, these are tasks for the people that maintain those platforms. Um, a lot of work happens behind the scenes of us talking to people and trying to discuss what we uh, believe needs to happen. Um, but we don't feel comfortable calling it a stable release while these issues are still outstanding. So it's just down to trying to convince people to um, get this work done. There's a few people that are typically involved in developing those that have obviously been on other things for a while. Um, and what we're working towards is getting them back on this stuff. Um, but really we can only tickle and influence behind the scenes. We can't, um, we can't tell anyone to do it. And at some point we will just make a cut and say some of the platforms don't make the cut and we'll never get a stable release badge so that others can move forwards because um, otherwise we'll just never end up, <laughs> we'll never get a risk loss 5.3 out. But most of them are actually making some progress. It's just slow progress. So if you did want to get hold of a release candidate and give us more feedback, perhaps find issues that you do want to fix, um, there is an area on our <coughs> website where you can find it. If you go to the download section, there's just a bit at the top of the page which tells you how to get the latest candidates. Um, and we would ask everyone, you don't have to be a developer to do this, just try it out and give us some feedback. Um, if you find anything that doesn't work, that you think should work, let us know via the forum or a ticket. And if you, yeah, if you can have a look at the draft news guide, because we think it's finished. If you do spot anything that still needs fixing, let us know, because we'd rather do a big print run and then find that there's something wrong. So we are working, we've, we're doing as much as we can to progress this, um, but I just have to emphasize, rule aren't the developers for all those platforms, so we, we're just passing you the news that from our view, <coughs> there's still things that are blocking those platform releases. And that was, all that I've got for you today. Um, any questions? You know, you, um, just a quick question. You know how you said you, you're not the developer of the other systems? That's right. It's for, the, for the Raspberry Pi yep. um, um, stuff, could some of it be a better, um, not better, but um, a close, quicker collaboration, or is that the same old thing of their company, they've got paid openism, so you've got to have a quicker transfer of a dialogue between Pies and uh, you guys? Not, none of those issues are to do with Raspberry Pi, the company. Right. Uh, they're just the computer platforms that that version of RISCOS that runs on their systems. So that version of RISCOS, yeah. I think the most active developer in there was Jeffrey Lee. Right. Doing the Raspberry Pi side of things. Yeah. Jeffrey Lee um, obviously got a lot of the things going ah, on right. at the moment. Yeah. So they've been yeah. less prolific yeah. in the risk loss yeah. community yeah. of late. Right. Um, so yeah. that's there's very few people at rule actually writing any code at any given moment. Yeah. And most of it is not on those And it hates the bounties for other people to chip yes. in yeah. 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 Are those Raspberry Pi issues for all Raspberry Pi's or are they specific to a model? There's a mix. As a mix. One thing that actually, if I've got one minute, I'll see if I can show you. So on the bounties page, you've got a table that shows the status of all the different bounties and you know the percentages that I showed you on a slide. If you scroll to the bottom, there's a little link that says more information, and it takes you to this page, and this page talks about what the bounty scheme is, how it works, and then it's got more information about each bounty, what's happening in it. So a little mini timeline of the major events, the milestones, and if it's in a testing phase, it will show you the download links to where you can get hold of stuff. So for anyone who wasn't aware that that existed and you want to get involved and help out, then that's the place to go. Can I ask what's yes. going to happen to, there's a couple of bounties like paint, yes. that have gone on hold. 
Yes. What's going to happen to those? Uh, so we are probably, it depends, so different ones have different answers. <laughs> um, what would typically happen is they'll be on hold because the claimants might have a personal or an important reason why they have to just pause what they're doing. And we're generally, you know, we're very supportive of that. Um, and we'll have to take a view and keep reviewing it and say, is it realistic that they're going to pick it up again? Or is it indefinitely on hold? Um, if it starts to look like things are indefinitely on hold, then what would typically happen is we'll talk to the claimant, we'll discuss about how far they've got, and we'll try to come to some sort of amicable arrangement where we can basically reopen the bounty and look for someone else to take it the remainder of the way. So most of these, we either believe there's a good chance that they're going to get picked up and carry on, or we're just keeping a watching brief on it until we decide, okay, we're just going to have to kind of settle it down with the way it has where it is, and then reopen it and allow someone else to pick it up. You said you're dropping yeah. C++, the C front thing. Yes. Is there anything going to replace that? Yes. Norcroft itself. So getting it to natively compile C++. That's what we would like to do. Why would one want to use Norcroft for this one? Yeah, so there are, there are certain advantages, but yeah, over time, I think that's a, also an option that we've explored, is just if you move all the source tree over to using a more uh, normal compiler on other platforms, um, most of it will just cross-compile anyway, risk or risk, to be honest, so you can generally build it on uh, a non risk os platform, but what we do there is we've got a non risk os port of the Norcroft compiler to do it. Um, so <laughs> so um, it can be done, but it, to a certain extent, um, the challenge there is finding the developer with the right mindset and the right background and understanding who's interested enough to do it. If the only person we've got in the risk os community who understands compilers is only really interested in North Norcroft compiler, then it's Norcroft features you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, there's a different way of tackling it, a different angle to come at all together is not to look at the compiler at all, it's to look at the source code and make the source code such that you can build it in a different compiler. Yes? That's correct. How does that affect this? Um, so it, it's a separate enterprise, but it's coordinated in the fact that we've made sure they they have certain allocations associated with these sorts of software stacks. Um, things like the SWIs, I don't know any of them. Um, and all of those allocations, we've made sure that they're using the same set and that their SWI numbers are the, the same SWIs, I have the same number, so that um, the higher level software, you only have to write it once, and it doesn't matter which driver you've got underneath, which file system, it will still work. Um, <coughs> so we've made sure that there's that level of coordination. <coughs> and this kind of branching and separate development of similar things is not new to Acorn world. Um, if you remember back to the old days of SCSI and SCSI drives, every different computer manufacturer in the, under the sun had their own SCSI drive and had their own SCSI filing system. Um, but Acorn did the same thing. Make sure the allocations are the same um, so that any higher level software, you don't have to write lots of, if it's this one, then this, if it's that one, then that. So that's the same. So our comp uh, have chosen to implement it themselves, which is great. It's, that's what they want on their, their fork of risk OS that they build for their platform. Um, for everyone else, this will be an option. So at, over time, this will be part of the standard risk OS download from the rule site. It's not going to go in the next stable release, but it will go straight out of the door immediately once the next stable release goes out. It will go into the next development release. It still looks like duplication of effort that possibly is spent on two different things instead. That's the rationale. Yes, it's still, that argument exists. Uh, but really, if you've got a commercial entity developing 
uh, their platform and they've got what they want to do for their customers, it, they may not be comfortable waiting for a bounty to deliver an outcome at some indefinite point in the future. Um, they may not be comfortable the, the bounty is targeting the hardware platform exactly that they want it to target first. So this is, this is likely to continue happening, it's just the world of open source software. Um, or it's the world of having an operating system with multiple different companies having their own products within it. Um, Risk OS Open prioritise things that are cross-platform and things that benefit the broadest section of the community at once. And we don't prioritise cracking a whip and getting a developer to do the thing as fast as possible. Um, generally because we're paying them McDonald's wages to do the work, so we can't really expect them to do it quickly. Um, where, whereas if you're a company where you've got revenue coming in from selling hardware to people, you can afford to pay someone a bit more money and get something done a bit faster. Yes? Can you know with the Wi-Fi stack, Yes. Is there any, this is going to probably be a really stupid question, is there any like USB Wi-Fi devices you can plug into it to use the Wi-Fi off a of USB so if you've got an older pipe? Not at the moment. Not at the moment. Is that, is that no. something that might be thought about? It, it, it could happen in the future, but it wasn't in the scope of what we're trying to do with this one. This is just about using native Wi-Fi wi hardware in the pipe. Um, but yes, there's no reason why that can't be added in the future. Well, yes. I'm using specific software, um, ProCAD, mm -hmm. and ProCAD uh, 1.07, which is our favorite version that we use, we use it you know, professionally, <coughs> um, works on 5.22, yep. and we have problems, it won't work on anything else, it won't work on anything above 5.22, okay. and I've been trying to get behind this, and they've even got to the extent of having just bought a second-hand Ionics and had it downrated to 5.22 right. in, in, in order that we can keep going. Yeah. And I've got um, other computers to the but they, it just it just doesn't work. And I'm wondering what we can do about this. Because the trouble is the software is not the source code has been lost, and it's not um, okay. it, it, it's been developed um, elsewhere to another level, but in a way that we don't like. And we want yes. to carry on using this um, 3.07. OK. Um, well, have you discussed this anywhere on the forums? No, I'm not very good at that. OK. Um, I would suggest that's the first port of call, is ask anyone else on the forums if they've got experience of it. And the other thing, um, it would be interesting to know how it's not working. So maybe we can have a chat later at the stand. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you.